today I would like to talk to you about grid chemistry at Merck and I would like to give you a development chemist perspective. Um, a little bit about Merck for those who are not uh, familiar with Merck. Um, Merck is named Merck in the US and Canada and everywhere else it's referenced to as MSD. Uh, it's more than 120 years old. Um, it uh, has medicines, of course, vaccines as well, animal health, quite a big uh, animal health um, department by now, and it's in brackets. We still have the com consumer uh, products, but not that any longer. As you all know, it has been sold, so Dr. Schultz and the uh, sunscreen, uh, Coppertone will go to a different company pretty soon. Um, our mission at Merck is to discover, develop, and provide meaningful, innovative products that save and improve lives. And we want to do that in a sustainable fashion so that we can continue serving patients for another 120 years, hopefully. So let's see. Um, we have a very sophisticated green and sustainable uh, chemistry program at Merck. Um, as you can see here, our logo. Um, you might not recognize the, um, this molecule here. Uh, it's Genovia, and Merck got the uh, very prestigious presidential green chemistry award twice for Genovia, and I will talk a little bit more today, give you more details about this synthesis. Um, so this is our nice Genovia, and hopefully inspiring um, for more green and sustainable chemistry at Merck. Um, we do have, uh, as many other pharmaceutical companies do, we do have public environmental goals. Um, these are currently uh, three major goals. One is uh, the use of water reduction by 20% by 2020, the reduction of greenhouse uh, gas emissions 20% um, by 2020 as well, and then where green chemistry comes into play, um, the uh, reduction of disposal of waste, and uh, this is by about 20% by uh, 2000, uh, 2017. Um, as said, um, we Merck got the uh, Presidential Green Chemistry Award three times, um, two for Genuvia and once for Emmond. Emmond um, is a drug treating emesis, this is a nausea and vomiting experienced very often during chemotherapy. This was a very nice redesigned and a lot more green um, synthesis, but uh, due to the time, I will uh, focus on the uh, Genuvia um, development and greening uh, of Genuvia. Um, so before I do that, I just would uh, want to give you a little overview what do process chemists do in pharmaceutical industry? Well, they provide active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs, for the development. And as you know, there are different phases. There is the preclinical phase, there is a phase one. This is preclinical phase is mainly uh, to get all the tox data in animal in order to get ready for the first clinical trial in uh, normally healthy volunteers. And then phase two, where you look for the dose, and phase three, where you look for efficacy of your drug. As you can see, as we move along um, these different phases, the demands for the uh, material is increasing. And um, I would say for this phase, probably preclinical phase one, phase two, um, a good synthetic route uh, is required. It needs to be safe, it needs to be robust, productive, the, of course, the impurity need to be controlled. Your API phase, um, that means what polymorph, it is a salt or whatever, the most stable polymorphs ideally needs to be identified. It needs to be at reasonable cost. And uh, it also needs to give you freedom to operate from an IP perspective. And it needs to be environmentally benign. This is really the driver within Merck, uh, even for the first supplies. Once you are getting ready for a phase three and then the drug looks um, like that it is efficacious and uh, that it really will be to the benefit of patients, uh, you start to identify the manufacturing route for commercial supply. 
And this really requires a great synthetic route to support the product for all the years to come. And it needs to be the lowest cost route because we do consider the emerging market and expanded access. And first of all, it needs to be sustainable. Um, the key message, and I already said this yesterday, good science is really the key to green chemistry and low cost synthesis. If we focus on developing the best chemistry, then as said, almost always, this leads to the lowest cost and the greenest process. Best chemistry at launch provides environmental and economical benefit over the lifetime of the product. And I think innovation is the key for best chemistry. And I hope that I can show you that at the example of Genovia. And I already have cited him yesterday. In every case, I know the green option is the low cost option. This is David Constable, the current director of the Green Chemistry Institute. And as I said, with decades of experience in green and sustainable chemistry. So um, diabetes is a growing worldwide epidemic. If you look at the numbers, in 2000, it was 151 million people suffered from diabetes. In uh, 2010, it was an increase of about 46%. And as you can see, it's around the world. So if you want to develop and to, to, to provide a drug uh, treating diabetes, it will be a large demand. So your volume will be large. And you better have a good synthesis in place because, as I said, um, this uh, route needs to be cost effective, it needs to be green, it needs to be sustainable. And therefore, I have picked Genuvia as an example to talk about today. So this is the molecule, this is Sigtagliptin, this is the active ingredient, the API, in Genuvia and Genomet. It's a first-in-class dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor, it's once daily oral treatment, and it was approved by FDA in uh, 2006. This is the first, the very first synthesis. Uh, this is for the first GMP delivery. So this was supporting the TOX. This was supporting the phase one, and it also was supporting phase two. As you can see, we have manufactured about more than 100 kilograms in 52% overall yield. It's not that bad. It's eight steps from acid one. But if you have a closer look, um, what we are doing here, you find out that we only have three productive bond forming steps. There's a 38%. Um, and if you look, um, the productive steps probably is compound one, the acid, uh, to the keto ester, co to compound two. Then we just do a manipulation. We do um, an asymmetric reduction. Um, we um, do the ester to acid hydrolysis. Then uh, even worse, well, we, at least we form an amide, but uh, use a protecting group. Uh, another productive step now is here the ring closure, but then the only thing you do, you open it up. Another productive, the third productive step is uh, you do the coupling with this heterocycle here, and then what you do is uh, you get rid of the uh, protecting group. Well, it's a reasonable synthesis, but I guess we could do better and um, ambitious as the chemists are in work. The question was, can we do it in only three steps? Well, if you want to do this, in, um, if you look at the synthesis, um, the key step really is, um, and, and the other thing we are doing here, we are introducing the Carl Center very early on. So uh, you schlep it really from very early on to the end. And this is something uh, you normally don't want to do that because you have to really uh, be aware of any uh, resumization or whatever can happen. So um, if you look at that, the desired reaction would be, well, why can't we have a ketimine here and then do the asymmetric reduction maybe in the last step? So this step at that time, or this type of reduction at that time asymmetrically wasn't really known. It was unprecedented in the literature. Now I know it's all over the place, but at that time it wasn't really known. Um, 
and then the chemists at Merck uh, took a step at that and they came up with this really nice synthesis. Um, it is a one step, one pot reaction um, and it can go either to the keto amide which can be isolated or it can go to the enamine directly. We are using a single solvent, it's a cetonitrile, and we are using compatible reagents to enable this one pot react, uh, reaction. So we are still using our acid. We are now doing um, the condenser reaction and we run this through uh, if you want to the keto amide or to the enamide amide. Um, but now, as I said, we need an unprecedented asymmetric hydrogenation of the unprotected enamine. So we are really, well, you can say we are cheating a little bit, so we have a kind uh, of a protecting group, but we are make use of most of the atoms um, in this sequence here. Um, so we looked at that asymmetric reduction. As said, at this time it was unprecedented. Uh, we did find in collaboration with Solvias, um, we did find a very good uh, system. This is rhodium based and uh, with this Joseph Foss, uh, Carl Josephos ligand. We're doing it at 50 degrees Celsius, 100 PSI, so not too bad, uh, and in methanol. And we do get a 94% E and 92% yield. Um, as said, it's a new asymmetric hydrogenation at that time. Um, it's overall now a two-step synthesis. So we are going from eight steps to two steps. We have a 63% overall yield. We are not using one protecting group, and we have implemented that at factory scale and did more than 100 um, uh, tons produced. And we, if you compare this to the very first supply synthesis, it's about 80% reduction in PMI, and we do not have any aqueous waste. As you can see here, this is the first generation route, um, the waste generation in kilogram, and this is the new route. So um, it is 80% reduction, so it was quite an achievement. But we are using rhodium in this chemistry. So if you look at the supply of critical elements, and uh, I have borrowed this slide because I really like it from David Constable, and that shows you, well, we have all these cool asymmetric reductions, but if you look at it from a life cycle um, analysis standpoint, rhodium is one of the rarest elements in the Earth's crust. So maybe five to 50 years of rhodium are left. If you look at these other uh, elements, zinc or the tin, well, it's there now, but very often also it's monopolized in some countries, and um, it's not really good, to, uh, it's not sustainable. So looking um, at further development of the sigtag lipton route, um, we really wanted to get rid of rhodium. It's also very expensive. Uh, so um, we want to avoid the formation of the intermediate ena enamine, and we already know that we can make the diketone. Um, and what we really want to do is we want to go directly from this ketone to the chyrolamine. We also, um, besides that rhodium is not uh, there in abundancy, um, it also needs uh, high pressure hydrogenation and some specialized equipment. So um, the question came up, can we use an enzyme for the direct conversion? Well, enzymes are a lot more environmentally benign. Um, the catalysts are grown in E. coli, they are renewable, they operate mostly in aqueous systems. They, from an economic standpoint, they are attractive. They have stable manufacturing costs um, compared to the rare earth metals. And it's an enabling technology. It opens up access to unique synthetic sequences. So more sustainable and it's green. So what we did, and you already have seen this picture um, yesterday, um, we want to use an enzyme, we want to use a transaminase enzyme, we want to make use uh, of this uh, reaction which does occur in nature um, 
in our bodies from alpha keto acids uh, to the amino acids. Well, you know, um, our substrate doesn't really look exactly uh, like the uh, natural substrate. So if we look at the natural enzyme, um, our molecule doesn't really fit anywhere in here in any active pocket. So it's not a surprise that there is absolutely no activity with the natural enzyme. But I mentioned it yesterday that uh, by enzyme evolution, um, you can accumulate a pocket mutations, and in the end, our molecule, the precursor, this one here, um, to cyclopyptin, um, fits very well. And in addition, it only now can have one orientation. And this one orientation now allows that this uh, transamination is done very stereoselectively. And uh, after, and just to picture this a little bit more, um, so this evolution of enzymes is a unique technology for making enzymes improvement through amino acid changes. So what you do is you define the, you define the backbone as you need it. it, needs to be stable to solvents and temperature, and it also needs to be easy to express. And then you develop a library of specificities on this backbone. And then you can really modify and evolve the enzyme so that it's doing the right thing, what you want it to do, stereoselectivity. Merck has done this uh, collaboration with a company called Codexis. And is doing this now, using this technique a lot uh, for many other transformations, stereoselectively using enzymes, not only transaminases. Um, so have a look um, what we came up with. So after the seventh round on enzyme evolution, um, I must say that in the first round, um, we saw 1% conversion to the desired amine. But what was really encouraging was this 1% was absolutely uh, enantioselective. And this was really the driver that we did all these evolution rounds. And after the seventh round, uh, we are getting 95% conversion and more than 99.9% enantioselectivity. .9 so no upgrade needed as we had to do with the rhodium catalyzed asymmetric hydrogenation by salt formation. So now we get what we want. The PMI reduction for this step is uh, from 30 to 23. Um, this reaction now, what, what we are doing here, as you can see, is we are using um, the transaminase enzyme. We are using it with a cofactor, and this is also the cofactor uh, in nature. Um, what we are doing, we are using the isopropyl amine as the <coughs> amine source. In nature, it's alanine but we are using isopropyl amine. Since we are using isopropyl amine, we have to distill off acetone um, to get the conversion to completion. Um, it saves multi-million per year versus the asymmetric hydrogenation approach. Um, the lower costs enable the medicine to be available to emerging markets, such as India. And as I already said, it got the EPA Presidential Green Chemistry Award in uh, 2010. So conclusion, green chemistry at Merck is really a corporate commitment. Uh, low costs, green chemistry, and good science go hand in hand. I hope that I was able to show you that. And um, when it comes to developing a manufacturing route, we think at Merck it's easy being green and really put a lot of resources on these commercial development routes to really come up with a low cost, green, and sustainable route. And I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Please raise your hand. Yes. I didn't quite understand the, uh, I didn't quite understand the notion that you want to introduce the chirality at the last possible step. Uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to me that that would be necessarily a good thing. Uh, well, what we try to do lately at Merck is uh, we try to get the functionalization as late as possible. Um, and um, the, the reason for that is really if, if you introduce it early, you have to take care, uh, you have to develop chiral assays for all your intermediates. You also have to uh, investigate if you see any racemization. 
And this is also um, when you submit this for, um, for an NDA for regulatory uh, approval, um, y you have to characterize all the steps. And if you have chorality in there, this is an additional characterization. This, this, uh, this is similar to the sort of azophobic approach to alkaloid synthesis, where you put the nitrogen in as late as possible. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Up right here. I'm Dr. Yadav from India, ISD. You know, the, it was an excellent synthesis of that. But you know, we are also facing problem with uh, two amino butanol. To what? Sorry. Two amino butanol. Two amino butanol is yeah. a used for TB drug. Okay. Yeah. Today it is made only by resolution of uh, two amino butanol and two D amino butanol, and then followed by some butanol you make. But you lose almost uh, six, more, more than 70 percent material you lose in the residuals. And there is no way we can come back, resumize that. I was wondering whether this technology can be implemented there. But two amino butanol cost, let me tell you. Two, D two amino butanol cost is less than $20 a kilo. Okay. Can it be used this method? In, in genetic amination, right? Um, I, I think it's very cost effective. So, um, as I said, I mean, it, it's a question if your molecule is a substrate for the enzyme, right? And you probably have to do enzyme evolution. Right. So, it's a very case by case, right. but these enzyme evolutions are done very quickly. So, we are looking at turnaround times, I would say, a month, maybe. Um, now that we have the technology in place, it took very longer uh, for this first example. What, so these what, what kind of concentration you is is continuous or it is a batch? Um, you can have it all. You you can do it in batch wise. We we also have now immobilized the enzymes and we can do it in organic solvents, uh, and we can do this in a continuous fashion. So you, you can do, but again, the enzyme immobilization is it technique by itself. Right. So again, it needs to be developed. But sure. if you develop it, you can do this whatever you want to do. Okay, that's good. Now, because there is also, you know, that uh, process of uh, Pfizer or pre mm -hmm. they also do very nice way mm -hmm. the enzymatic header. But of course, yours is a reduction. Yeah. <laughs> what, what happens to uh, amino Two amino propanol that becomes acetone or what? Pardon? Two amino butanol. Yeah. You use as a amine transfer reagent, right? Uh, the cofactor, you mean? Cofactor. Yeah. But that, that's practically amine transfer. Yeah. From that. Yeah, and we remove it after the reaction. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Together with the enzyme. Right. And so actually, the, this, so other, this other byproduct could be acetone, right? Um, if you immobilize the enzyme. Um, it makes your whole life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. If you do it in a batch um, No, I'm way, wondering what happens to the two amino you, you can precipitate You can precipitate Genuvia out of the reaction, and then that leaves the enzyme and all the cofactors behind. Okay, thank you. I have a question concerning the development of the enzyme. How do you select the original natural wild type enzyme? Do you make a screening of different enzymes? And then during the development, you spoke about seven steps. Uh, do you think a random development is the uh, good idea or do you really make uh, defined mutations in, in defined positions? I think it's a mix uh, of both. Um, so you do mutations, and then you submit it to the reaction conditions you really would like to work 
and then uh, you, you uh, continue the ones uh, which survive uh, will be mutated further, right? Um, so what you do is um, you, you take the wild type, you see the ones which do at least a little bit of the, what, what you desire them to do, and then uh, you mutate them, and then you uh, submit them to again to the reaction conditions, and then you go, yeah. Okay, and, and what about the, the original enzyme, the wild type enzyme? Do you also make a large screening there, or do you say that's the one where we would like to work on? Um, no, there is a, a screening there as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is a screening mm -hmm. there as okay, well. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, Ingrid, in one of your steps, you, I, I saw that you have uh, water in the MSO. So, I guess correct. that that is for solubility. <coughs> That's correct. Solubility purposes. Yep. But also, the MSO is a denaturing agent for the enzyme. Have it you seen, have you tried to replace that solvent with another? Uh, Substance that might be not as aggressive to the enzyme that might also help to the reaction. Yeah, th that is the reason that we have immobilized the enzyme. And um, once you have immobilized the enzyme, you can use whatever solvent you want to use, and you actually don't need uh, an aqueous media as well. So solubility is not an issue any longer. But you're absolutely right. You have to be very careful uh, with your DMSO. And we couldn't really get around it. So we did need it uh, at some concentration. But the immobilization um, of the enzymes really gives you all freedom you need and makes it even greener, because now you don't have to extract it out of the aqueous mixture and uh, do the crystallization. You now use this uh, organic solvent, and then you crystallize it from the solvent. And you can do it um, in continuous flow mode. So overall, again, it gets a lot more greener again and sustainable. Okay.